We're going to talk about friendship and living the abundant life in friendship. So this is going to be interactive. So I'm actually going to be your talk show host for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So what I'm going to need is I'm going to need you to be interactive. So I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to come out in the crowd and bring the mic and, and talk about you and see what you think. Is that okay? You ready to do that? Okay. So this is, this is not just going to be me kind of giving you a lecture. So let's try that out. First and foremost, who came here? with some friends. Who came with friends? All right. All right. So I'm going to have you, can you stand up for me? Did you raise your hand? Can you stand up for me? So tell me, tell, tell everybody what your name is and tell us what you love about your friends. My name's Maeve and I love that they always support me no matter what I'm going through. They support you no matter what. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, man, you stand up. Tell us what your name is and why you like your friends. Sean. My name is Sean and, um, I like my friends because they're real funny. I mean, that's they're funny? what I like. Okay, yeah, awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, man, stand up. You got it? Stand up, tell me, stand up. Tell us what your name is. Uh, my name is Ruben, and I like my friends because they're cool to chill with. All right, they, they're cool to chill with. All right. Somebody else. Somebody else, somebody else. All right, all right, all right, all right. Tell me what your name is. Stand up. Tell me what your name is, and tell me why you like your friends. My name is Nada, and I like my friends because they're like your second family. Your second family. Interesting. Okay. All right, let me ask you another question. Shh. Let me ask you this. So if you, ha if you came with friends, you might have just met your friends in your youth group. You might have known them for nine months, or maybe you've known them for a long time. So I'm going to ask you this. I want you to tell me where you met your best friend. Raise your hand. Tell me where you met your best friend. Stand up and tell me. So stand up, tell us what your name is. Hey, I'm Emily Christman, and I met Listen. my best friend in junior high. Junior high, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, anybody? <laughs> all right, girl. All right, stand up, tell us what your name is. My name is Crystal. And where'd you meet your best friend? Um, I met my best friend in junior high. Junior high, all right, we got some junior highs. All right, man, stand up. Tell us what your name is and where you met your best friend. I'm Javier, and I've known my best friend Chris since daycare. Oh, daycare, 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 daycare. All right. All right, all right, all right. One more, one more, one more, one more. Oh, girl, come on. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Tell us what your name is and where you met your best friend. My name is Bethany, and I went to my best friend's daycare, and I've been knowing her for 14 years. Oh, yeah, you have been. All right. Awesome. Okay. So I came across this video. I came across this video of little kids. I love little kids. If you heard if the ladies this morning, we talked about some of my experiences at daycare. And I love little kids because little kids often reveal some beautiful things. So I want to show you, because don't you think little kids often make friends easily? Doesn't it seem like they make friends like really easily? And I want to show you the mindset of little kids and how they make friends. So Heather, could you show that video, please? You say hello to somebody. And then you start being friends. <laughs> Most of them you meet in preschool. So like you go to preschool and then like you hardly know anybody and you say hi to someone and then it becomes your friend. You meet a friend because you talk gently to them, you don't talk rough, and then they see that you want to, they want to be a friend. Like play with if, them. And if you see them, then you play with them and go in the park sometimes. You talk to them, you say hello, you meet each other, then you play with each other. Pretty easy, huh, for little kids? Pretty simple. Uh, can you show that slide, Heather, that slide with the heart on it? Uh, I love this particular slide because it's a quote from St. Catherine of Siena. And she says that the soul cannot live without love. She always wants to love something because she is made of love and by love I created her. Let me ask you this, just in the quiet of your heart. Let me ask you to think of some of your favorite memories. They can be recently, they can be from a long time ago. Maybe there's something really, really big. Maybe there's something small. Maybe it's Christmas morning. Maybe it's, I don't know, when one of your brothers or sisters was born. Maybe it's the day you won a state championship or something. Or maybe it's just hanging out with your friends and you said to yourself this, you said, I wish, I wish time would stop 
right here. And I, I wish this moment would never end. <laughs> the reason why we long for things like that is because we're made for relationship. We're made for communion. Because we're made of the image and likeness of God, and God is a family. You're conceived in a family. Ideally, you're raised in a family. This is why we're gathered together here today in a family. This is why you play sports with the family. You, play, you get together with the family. We get together with other people. This is why isolation can often break us often break us. And sometimes I talk about this. Have you ever seen those reality shows where they send like camera crews in a maximum security prison? Have you ever seen those, right? It's called like Locked Up or something like that, right? And they send these camera crews and they send them into maximum security prisons, especially the, pr the male prisons. And if you've ever seen what happens in maximum security prison, a lot of the stuff that happens on, in the maximum security prison, they can't even show you on TV because it's too violent. And you talk about some brokenness, right? But even among maximum security prisoners, there's a set of prisoners that are too violent even for maximum security prison population. So you tell me, what is the worst punishment you can inflict in America on somebody who's already in maximum security prison? What is it? Isolation. Where for 23 hours a day, 23 hours a day you're by yourself in a room, locked up. Nobody looks at you. Nobody talks to you. Nobody even acknowledges that you exist. And for one hour a day, one hour a day, you're let outside to walk the yard, maybe lift some weights, and you go back into your cell. And maybe in maximum security prison, that's the only way that they can quell prison violence because that's all they can do. But that is the antithesis of what it means to be human. And I wonder how often, I know because I feel like this myself sometimes, like this morning we were talking about, you know, like our Twitter feeds and all that kind of stuff where you scroll through all this stuff and you have all these friends and these people like your stuff on the internet, but then you feel so isolated. And you say to yourself, man, does anybody see me? Does, it, does anybody know me? If anybody had any idea what happened at my house at night, man, would anybody even care? And then enter our friends. I'd say we have lots of different kinds of friends. Um, there's a, a Greek philosopher, Aristotle, who says there's different kinds of friendship. There's a, a friendship of convenience, there's a friendship of pleasure, and there's a friendship of virtue. And I love the book of Sirach. Can you show that slide? Sirach is a, one of the books in the wisdom books, and it talks about different kinds of friends, about friends who are going to be there for you only when it's convenient for them, friends that will sit and have dinner with you, but then when your life gets tough, they're like, mm, I'm out. And then you've got friends that will be with you to the very end. Friends that you can count off. Um, the wisdom book says that it's, a friend is like your other self. And I love this from Sirach. It says, a faithful friend is a sturdy shelter. He who has found one has found a treasure. There is nothing so precious as a faithful friend. No scales can measure his excellence. Whoever fears the Lord directs his friendships aright. For as he is, so is his neighbor also. There's a saying that you show me who your friends are, and I'll know who you are. And sometimes we say, well, sister, I mean, come on, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't really matter who I hang out with. I mean, I go to church, I do a youth group, I do all that kind of thing, it doesn't really matter. But as your friends go, so you will go. So let me ask you this. If some of your best friends are people that you enjoy, you have fun with, people that love you, people that support you no matter what happens. They're always there for you. They're like a sturdy shelter, like a firm foundation. And real, real friendship, they're going to tell you the truth even when it's kind of difficult. But have you ever had friends maybe that um, you feel like you just have to fit in? You've had friends where, you know, you don't want to say something and then people are talking about somebody and all of a sudden you just like betray other people that you're friends with because you just want to fit in. Or you walk away from a conversation and you're like, this is, not, this is not me. Like, I don't like who I am when I'm with these people. Or if you've had friends that betray you. So let me ask you from your own experience, if what you're willing to share, very briefly, what would make us say, I guess we would call a bad friend, all right? So if you had somebody in your life that wasn't really a true friend, what are some of the characteristics that they would exhibit? How you know they're not your true friend? How do people treat you and you ask yourself and you're like, mm, they're not, they're not my true friend. They're not my true friend. Raise your hand and tell me, all right? I want to know what you think. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us what your name is and tell me a characteristic of how you know somebody's not your real friend? Um, I'm Nicole, and if they're, like, untrustworthy, then they're a bad friend. What would be, like, untrustworthy? Can you give me an example? 
like someone you can't tell something without knowing that they won't tell anybody. Okay, so somebody might betray you, betray your secrets. Hmm, interesting. Who else? Who else? Yes, ma'am. Tell us what your name is and tell me a characteristic of somebody who's not a good friend. My name is Raina, and when they talk bad behind your back. Oh, they talk about you behind your back. Yeah. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Anybody else? How about some guys? Any guys? All right, man. You want to? <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Give me some guys. Give me some guys. All right, yes. You want to? What's that? You want to answer my question? Okay, so stand up and tell us your name. And tell me what would make, how would you know somebody's not your real friend? Just tell me how you would know somebody's not your real friend. How, what are some characteristics? My name is Jaime Rodriguez. <laughs> the way they act with you. Hmm? The way they act with you. Yeah, the way they act. So what would be a characteristic of how you know somebody's not your real friend? How their, would they act toward you? Their demeanor you? towards you. Their the mean? way they speak to you. Okay, the way they talk to you. Okay, all right, yeah. What else? What else? Yes, sir. Stand up. Yep. All right. Tell, me, tell us your name and how you would know. Uh, Dylan Goche. Uh-huh. The question is, <laughs> I'm like Oprah. OK. So the question is, how would you know somebody's not really your friend? If they're not a good friend to you, how would you know? When you're hearing your other friends, but they, but they talk on you to your other friends. They talk about you behind your back to other friends. Your other friends come tell you, you know, what they're saying about you to your other friends. All right, so then you hear about it behind the back, right? Yeah, okay, they come back around. You know, There's like a lot of back going around there. Around okay, a lot around. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, stand up. Tell us what your name is. My name's Hunter. Hey. Uh, I think a, a bad trait in a friend would be a friend that's not interested in your salvation. Like not interested? They don't care about your soul getting to heaven. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so, so Hunter has made a very good point, right? So he's saying that, you know, it's very true. People that talk about you behind your back, people that you even have to wonder, are they talking about you? Really? Are they talking about you? People that even have to wonder, but people that certainly don't care, don't care about what, you know, who you are or what you do, okay? So can you pull up that slide for me, Heather? So when we talk about relationships, we talk about friendships, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about love. Now, in our society, love, you know, automatically is assumed with, like, romantic relationships, and a lot of times it's automatically associated with sex. But those things do not necessarily go together. A lot of times they're very, very broken. So before we can talk about authentic friendships, what that really means, we have to talk about what authentic love is. What authentic love is. And so as Christians, we know what love is. It's the definition St. Thomas Aquinas gives us is to will the good of the other is to will your good. So if I love you, I know that I love you, not how strongly I feel about you, because feelings may come and go. How many of you would say that friendship, being an, a true friend, is always easy? How many of you would say it's always hard? <laughs> You're like, dang, that's hard. How many of you would say it's a mix of both? Because sometimes it is, isn't it? Sometimes it is to be a really a faithful, honest friend means you have to say yes to some things and you have to say no to some things. It's a risk. Love is always a risk. And the love we kind of yearn for, if you were to tell me later what some of your favorite memories were that we talked about earlier, I bet they had something to do with communion and connecting and relationship. Those are the kind of things that we long for, things that aren't just momentary, but ultimately things that will last to eternity. Because as humans, we're called to be gift and communion. We're called to give the gift of ourselves to others. So I know that I love you based on how much I'm willing to will your good. And guess what? Even if it comes at a cost to myself, that's how I know that I love you. Because it's very easy for us to say, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. But when it comes down to it, like you just told me, man, it's not always easy, is it? So let me ask you this, all right? So serious comments only, please, and, and brief. What are some of the challenges that you've had in your relationships, okay? What are some of the challenges that you've had where you've had to choose what was truly good? Maybe you had to tell the truth. Maybe you had to say no, maybe you had to say, and it's not about judging anybody, saying, oh, you know, you're not a good person, I'm not gonna be your friend. It's talking about what is ultimately good, because when we talk about virtue, virtue is to pursue the good. 
to pursue all that is good, true, and beautiful, and that's ultimately what we want. And we might settle for this kind of broken, broken idea of love and friendship. Oh, man, but we're not yearning for that. We are yearning for so much more. So let me ask you this. Tell me one experience, if you want to, where you had to challenge, where you had to choose what was good, even when it was difficult. Somebody tell me. Somebody willing to share with me. Serious comments only, please. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you tell us what your name is? My name is Jeff Boudreaux. Uh, one time I had a friend who came to me and she was just talking, and it was normal, but, uh, but then she told me that, you know, she had premarital sex. Uh -huh. And so she was confiding in me and asking me questions, and I had to tell her, you know, all that, how it was bad and all this. But uh, she said it hurt really bad to hear it, but that she was glad that she heard it from me, like coming from me and coming, consoling. I was consoling her and trying to help her to make the right decision. And so you probably told her out go, of love, right? Exactly. And that was hard for, for you. For her greater, her. yeah, I didn't want to have to tell her, oh, you committed a terrible sin, because I, I used the word adultery, and she said, that's a terrible word to use. I said, well, you, it yeah. kind of is. So that's a risk, that's a huge it risk. It was, yeah. it was a risk on our friendship, Amen. but yet ultimately it helped us grow closer. Oh, you're still friends? Yeah. Your friendship is closer? Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Yes, yes ma'am. Tell us what your name is. Hi, my name is Andrea. Um, I had to choose a friendship. I had to choose God before I could choose my friend. And um, it was like her, um, who was her quince, her 15th party. And uh, she was like, you either, and there was a conference at that day, like a day conference. And she was like, you either go to my, you go to the conference or you're no longer gonna be friends with me. Mm. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I'll pray for you. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, so I mean, are you friends still? Did she come back? Um, no. Okay, so no, tell me how that was for your heart, like as a person, what, how did um, that challenge you? Like, it hurt a lot, because yeah. like my friendship means a lot to me. Yeah. Like especially her friendship, and we've been friends for a really long time, mm -hmm. but for me to say no to her, and but for her to say that to me was kind of like, you just put everything on the line just for, because just missing your party, like why would you do that? Like, obviously, I would choose God before you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it kind of sucked, but it's all right. All right. Amen, girl. Amen. All right. So I feel like I've neglected this part of the room. I'm going to go over here. Somebody else wanted, sh wanted to share with me something. Actually, you're, you're, you're getting volunteered. Okay, so <laughs> here you go. Could you tell us your name? Um, my name's Maddie. And um, a while back, I was with my friends, and the next day, it was a Saturday night, and they kept on wanting me to drink and drink and drink. And I was at their house, and I'm like, no. So I went inside with their mom, and they pulled me back outside. Let's go, let's go. And I'm thinking, like, I have church tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. uh, and this, I'm, I'm underage. I mean, no, yeah. let, no. And um, I called my mom to come get me, and the next morning they all harassed me for it. Oh, yeah, you're choosing God over alcohol. You only live once. Let's go. So, oh, yeah, I do only live once. That's why I'm doing it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good for you. All right, one more. Can we get one more? Anybody else over here? All right. Yes. Can you tell us your name, please? Um, my name's Gabby. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, this is probably not that bad, but it's all right. Just share. It. One time, I went to the favorite dance in my school, mm -hmm. and I had practice the other day, so I had to leave early, and that's a hard decision to make because you want to stay in the party, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's it. So you chose to leave early because you had a prior commitment that was more responsible than yeah. partying all night. Yeah, that's a good choice. Thank I'd you. I'd say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you, you heard a variety of different experiences of people having to choose uh, what was right, even if it's difficult, okay? So, but what if we have experiences like this? What if love is really just a powerful emotion, right? What if love is just something where, you know what, I'm just going to do what I want to do, and I feel powerfully strong about you, right? And uh, don't make a big deal out of it. So I would equate that to what I would call kind of like my water bottle here. So I have a fabulous water bottle here. It's full of water. All right, so I'm part camel, so I'm just going to drink because I'm thirsty, okay? So I'm just going to drink some water. And uh, once I quench my thirst, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this water bottle away. Oh, poor thing, right? Because I don't want it anymore, and it served its purpose, and I've drained it of anything that I have sort of use for, and so I'm going to discard it. And it reminds me a lot about 
Pope Francis has been talking a lot about encounter and culture and a throwaway culture. <laughs> a throwaway culture that says, you know what, when I've drained my pleasure from you, I love you as long as you give me pleasure, right? I love you as long as you're fun and you're good looking and you give me pleasure and I get what I want. But as soon as, as soon as you're not fun anymore, as soon as I've drained my pleasure from you, so to speak, well, I guess it just didn't work out, right? And then the water bottle is dropped, so to speak, which is our hearts, and our hearts are shattered, and we call that love. <laughs> and I totally disagree with that, and I disagree with that on a number of levels, but I disagree with that because if you ask yourself what you long for most, you long for a friendship, a love that will last, something profound, something strong, so that you can be yourself, you can be totally you, and you know what? Your friends are going to tell you the truth, aren't they? That's hard sometimes. It is hard. But what ultimately that gives us is that gives us a foundation to stand on. So I'm going to just offer you three things, just three ideas, okay, about friendship. Because in order for us to say no to what is bad, in order to pursue what is good, or to say even no to what is good, to pursue what is better, we have to have a foundation, a strong foundation. So first and foremost, you and I must be encountered, we must be continually encountered by God. So that means I've got to be able to allow Christ to come and continually encounter me and to bring out of me all that is good, true, and beautiful, because if I don't know who I am, and I don't know where I'm going, and I don't know where I came from, well, then how am I going to help you? I don't even know. And I, I love politics. I often listen to political talk shows. And many years ago, I was watching a show, and the guest on the show was talking about American culture. And he was saying as Americans, he said, you know what, as Americans, we don't know our foundation. We don't know our founding fathers. He's like, we don't know where we came from as Americans. And he said, and we don't know where we're going. And he said, if we don't know where we came from and we don't know where we're going, we're going to be easily manipulated. It's like, amen, man. If we, my dear friends, as we as sons and daughters of God, if we don't know that we came from God and that we are on a mission, a mission of excellence going into the heart of God forever, the, all that we long for, the beautiful desires that we have, the desires for communion, the desire for longing, the desire for intimacy, to into me see is a beautiful thing. The desire itself is not the problem. <laughs> The problem a lot of times is where we go to, to kind of fill our desires. And many times where we go is a place that's very, very broken. And it ends up being like the water bottle where we mutually use each other. And then we just drop it and we say, well, you know. One of the most horrifying songs that I've heard, I listen to just, I like iTunes radio. So I, I go for walks and listen to iTunes radio. And one of the most horrifying songs that I heard last year, it's an old song now because it came out like a year ago, right? So it's like archaic. But one of the most horrifying things I heard, it was like watching a bad car accident. Like you couldn't help but just like stare at it. But I was listening to it. It was a song that had the refrain of a girl saying, let me take a selfie, okay? All right? Now, I'm not saying anything about selfies because I think selfies are fun. But if I'm listening to this girl, okay, this girl's very self-centered. She's somebody who's all about herself and she's a, you know, your quintessential kind of spoiled American girl in a club, right? And she's saying, um, why is a DJ playing Summertime Sadness? It's like not even summer. And that girl, she's wearing cheetah. Like, who wears cheetah? And Jason, he's been texting me like all night last night, but he didn't like my Instagram photo. Should I take another selfie? Like, should I use another filter? And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? So, 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 so self-centered. A woman who doesn't know what to do with her beauty. Like we talked about this morning, uh, the beauty that's called to heal, called to bring people into eternity, that's turned in on herself. How can she be a good friend when she's so self-centered? But really, it was the last part of the song that actually broke my heart. The last part of the song, she says this. She said, uh, Jason, he liked my Instagram photo. Should I go home with him? I guess I took a good selfie. So she's going to... Um, go home with a guy, and she's going to give her body to him, and he's going to give his body to her, and they're going to mutually, mutually use each other. And then in the morning, it's going to be like, it's just like it is always. The water bottle falls to the floor and shatters, hearts fall to the floor and shatter, and they say, well, it just didn't work out. Because somebody liked her Instagram photo. I think we do what we do a lot of the times is because we're hungry. I know Christopher West very famously says, you know, if you're hungry, you're going to eventually eat out of the dumpster. But what awaits us is not dumpster, my dear friends. What awaits us is the eternal banquet. So as we are founded in God, as we allow God to build a deep foundation in us, then we can choose 
what is good. We can be a good friend. So secondly, so be encountered by God. Secondly, be a good friend to people. And let me ask you this, serious comments only, what does it mean to be a good friend? So we can say, yeah, I need to be a good friend, sister. I need, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a good friend. What does it mean? What does that even mean? Because if I don't have a definition of what that means, of what goodness means, I'm going to have a hard time being a good friend if I don't know what that means. Yes, ma'am. Can you stand up and tell us who you are? What does that mean? I'm Caitlin, and I think being a good friend means always having their back no matter what. Okay. What if they're doing something horrendously awful and wrong? You should have their back and okay. try to help them through it. Help them through it. Okay. All right. Thank you. What else? What else? What else? What else? What do you think? What does it mean? What does that mean to be um, a good friend? I'm Kara. Um, to be a good friend, you have to be there for them no matter what, even if you're telling them something they don't want to hear. Okay, so you have to be Even willing to tell the truth. Even if it breaks their hearts, you okay. have to tell them something they need to hear. Something it they may need be to... harming them, so you need to tell them. Okay, so you're going to tell them out of love. Yes. Yes, okay. What else? What does it mean? What does it mean to be a good friend? Anybody down here at the far end? I feel like I've neglected y'all. Anybody down here? Okay, ma'am in the back? Yes. We're like in the dark back here. Um, to be a good friend is to always have your back, like even like whenever they go through hard times. Okay, so when they go through hard times, so you're not going to ditch them when it becomes inconvenient. Okay, yes. Ernest Lopez, uh, being a good friend is uh, leading them to Christ. Leading them to Christ, yes, a amen. Okay, so... So yes, you know what, yes, I'm going to have people's back, and yes, we're going to be there for them when it's difficult, but ultimately what I want for them is don't you want to be with the people that you love forever? Don't you want to be with them for all eternity? And it's not something where, you know, kind of a cliche, to be like, well, let's just follow Jesus. We're going to pursue Christ because Christ is all we long for. He is all that is good, true, and beautiful. So as you pursue what is good, true, and beautiful, every time you allow God to encounter you, every time you come closer to him and you bring others closer to Christ, which I can tell you, it's sometimes through the words that you speak, but I tell you loud and clear, it is how you live your life. That is the loudest witness you will ever give, is how you live your life. As you do that, it attracts people. And I was telling the ladies this morning that um, when this priest came into my life, when my life was a train wreck, I was an alcoholic and my life was a mess. And here I was, they thought I was so successful, you know, playing Division I college volleyball and pursuing all these things. And I, I thought, I, I didn't know what to do. And I didn't have friends in my life. And quite frankly, I was not a good friend not a good friend. I've had to go to confession for the ways that I have led my friends into sin. Even as an adult, I've had to go back and apologize to people just how awful I was in high school. As I was awful to them because I was so insecure. Like when you bully people and pick on people, it doesn't say anything about them. It says something about you. It says something about me, how unkind that I was. And I had to go and apologize to them and to be healed and to go and reconcile to that. And this priest, God sent this priest into my life. And this man lived just, he lived differently. Pope Benedict says, the one who has hope lives differently. And if you know somebody, I hope you know somebody in your life who's authentically holy. I hope you do. Because it's captivating. And you know what? A lot of times it's messy and it's not easy and their life certainly isn't perfect. But they just live differently. And I, remember, I remember looking at Father Pinto. I mean, God bless him. He passed away a couple years ago in a car accident. Very, very tragic. Very sudden. And oh my gosh, we all miss him to this day. But I remember being 20 years old. I remember looking at his life saying man, I don't know what you've got. Like, I don't know what that is, but I want it. What would happen to the world if you and I actually lived our faith so ardently that people looked at our life and was like, dang, man, I don't know what you got, but I want that, right? A lot of times people look at our life and they're like, Ooh, what you, oh, you're a Christian? I'm, I called myself a Catholic for a long time and my life was anything, anything but. And I think that in our desire and our longing that God gives each and every one of us that builds a firm foundation because like Chris or like Deacon Ralph was saying last night, just because they put a ring on his finger because he had never lived a moral life before he got married doesn't automatically think just because you get married you're going to be faithful. It's an exercise, it's a training in virtue and we admire people like that, don't we? We admire people that are virtuous, that are good. It's just incredible to us. But a lot of times we don't know where to get that. So as God, number one, encounters us, and secondly, how we, um, how we are able to encounter others, how we are able to give that gift to be able to be a good friend that's going to change other people's lives. But let me ask you this. 
So what if you're saying to yourself, well, sister, I have a lot of friends, and uh, not all of them are too virtuous. But you know what? That's okay, because I'm virtuous and I'm awesome, all right? So, uh, and you said to yourself, well, it doesn't really matter. Or say, say you're going out with somebody. Say you're going out with somebody, and you are an ardently faithful, and you know what you want in life, and they're not anything. They don't really care. They don't really care about eternal salvation. They don't really care anything about that. What's going to happen? What would happen to them? So I need, are there any senior guys here? Guys are going to be seniors in high school. Seniors or juniors. All right. Guys only. All right. So I need one of these men to be a volunteer. Want to be a volunteer? Want to be a volunteer? All right, man. Come on. Come on. All right. Are you afraid of heights? All right. Hop on up. Stand up. Turn around. <laughs> Tell us what your name is. Sean. Everybody say hi, Sean. Um, isn't he handsome, ladies? Yeah, he's totally handsome. All right. He's like, what? Okay, all right. Other guy's like, woo. Okay, so Sean is somebody who is a man who is pursuing what is good. He is a man who knows who he is in the eyes of God, that he's a son of God and he is virtuous. He's using his strength his, all, and all of his excellence to pursue what is good. And as a man, what he wants to do, as a woman, he wants to protect my beauty. He doesn't want to use it or misuse it for himself. He wants to protect it. So he's somebody who's very ardently on the path. He's an honest, authentic man, and yes, he struggles, and yes, it's not easy, and yes, he has to say yes to things and no to things, but this man is noble. He's a noble man. Now, he wants to go out with me. This is awkward, but hold my hand. Okay, all right, here we go. So we're like, illegal. Okay, that's okay. So uh, here we are. I'm like old enough to be his mother, but that's okay. Okay, so I'm a senior girl in his class, and I don't know what my beauty is for. I'm just going at them because he's hot, okay? That's all I'm doing, right? So I don't know what my beauty is for. I don't know that I'm called to lead him with my beauty, with my kindness, with my femininity to heaven. The most important thing is not how much time he spends with me, but how much time he spends with God. I don't know anything about that. And quite frankly, I don't really care, all right? Because I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. But Sean's a very kind guy, and he sees in me, he sees potential in me, he sees promise in me, and he decides no matter what, he's still going to go out with me because he says to himself, I think I can save her. I'm going to save her. All right, so Sean, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you pull me up onto the table with you. You got guns, man, go to the gun show. Okay, all right, here we go. You're just going to use both hands. So, yeah, so I want you to go ahead and pull me up. Come on, pull me up. Like, just try for the love of Pete. Pull me up. Oh, come on, okay, one more time. Oh, did you just call me fat? No, you didn't. Okay, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm totally joking. Okay, one more time. Because you're strong, I know you can do this. <laughs> Almost. You ready? Oh. That was pretty easy, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, you did. <laughs> So let me, let me show you this powerful, isn't it? Because you see the inequality of our relationship, not because he's better than me, but because where we are spiritually, what we're pursuing, where you, friends, where your friends will go, you will go. And it was so much easier for me. I mean, he's much, if we got an arm wrestling match, he would totally win, and ain't no shame in that, because he's stronger than I am, right? But it was so much easier for me to pull him down at, for where I was, because I have more leverage than it was for him to pull me up. But I love what he did. What did he do after he fell? Got back up, man. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The third thing I want to talk about, okay, after being encountered by God, being a good friend to others, is being able to receive the gift that others give to us. Do you have any friends in your life that they're amazing, but they're always givers? They're, you try to give them something, they're like, oh, no, 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 you don't have to. Like, it's okay. You know, no, no, I'll come pick you up. And you're like, I'm going to pick you up. Like, no, I'm picking you up. I'm going to show up five minutes early so you can't pick me up, right? People that are always giving. Let me ask you this. What, is, what are some of the best things that your friends have ever done for you? What are some of the best things that you were just amazed that your friends did this for you? You can't believe it that they did it for you. Okay, can you stand up and tell us? Uh, <clears throat> hi, my name is Alexis. Um, my friend Lisa took me to youth group when I was in a very low place, so it's in very So she came and she sought you out and she took you, she, it probably changed your life, I yeah. would imagine, yeah, because she went out of her way. Thank you very much. All right, what, are some, what else? I, what are some of the most amazing things your friends have ever done for you? 
My name is Dulce, and the best thing my friend has ever done to me is um, the nights that I cannot stand being alone because at night, that's when it kills me. Mm -hmm. And so my friend, like, when she lives out in the country, um, and she doesn't know how to drive, but one night she just, like, I couldn't deal with it, and she drove all the way to my house just to save my life. Amen, girl. Amen. Amen. You want to? Tell us. Tell us what your name is and what's one of the best things your friends have ever done for you. My name is Matthew, and the best thing that my friend Andrea did for me is she helped me find God when I was really in a dark place. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else over here? Yeah? That's you. That's you. <laughs> like, I won. Okay, here we go. Tell us what your name is and what's the best thing your friend's ever done for you. How y'all doing? My name is James Welch, and uh, I'm from Oakdale right here. Well, um, one thing that uh, this really affected me was I was in the eighth grade, and I got in a real bad car accident with my sister. And when I came out of the emergency room, the emergency room doors, I saw all my friends right there in a big huddle praying mm -hmm. for me and my family. And whenever we walked out, it was just like a great thing because I felt the love, and they just accepted us right there so I just that's one great thing amen amen anybody else over here anybody else you want to you want to tell us what your name is what are some of the best things your friends ever done uh, my name is Damon Beck and back in the seventh grade I sprang my knee for like the tenth time and it was really bad mm -hmm. and one day because I couldn't work the crutches my friend actually got up and helped me get up to my next class one story up. Oh, amen, yeah. All right. How about some ladies? Yes, ma'am. There you go. I'm Michaela, and when I was starting into my faith, my, I couldn't afford to go to any retreats, and so my friend and her family paid for a good three other retreats so I could go on them. Nice. That's nice. Yes, sir. There you go. You ready? Tell us what your name is. I'm Rudy Roche. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the greatest things that my, one of my friends has ever done for me is uh, all of, everybody was neglecting me, and she stood up for me and was with my, on my back, with, she had my back oh, yes, while everybody. <laughs> while everybody else was making fun of you, she stood up for you. Nice, okay. All right, one more, one more, one more. All right, here we go. Okay, so I got my wisdom teeth out and my parents had to go to a wedding. And so they left me home alone and my friends, oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> my like, friends wah, wah. were gonna go to the movies, but they came and they spent the night with me so that I wouldn't have to be alone. Oh, I love that. Okay. So I think it's interesting if you listened, you probably noticed that uh, what, what people are talking about are some very vulnerable experiences. There's something that we call the power of vulnerability, the power to be able to receive what is good from other people, because ultimately that's what we do. We receive first and foremost from God, and God desires to fill us with himself. Like Jesus says, I don't call you slaves, I call you friends. And that's not a superficial, shallow friendship, it's a friendship that gives itself to the very end out of love. And as your friendships go, as we talked about earlier, so you will go. So the choice, my dear friends, is up to you. I would advise you this. Choose your friends very, very wisely. Choose them wisely because you spend a lot of time with them and they have a profound, profound impact upon your life. And as you choose friends who lead you toward God, who lead you toward all that is good, true, and beautiful, the byproduct of that is you just become happier. Have you noticed that? Have you been in friendships that were really dark friendships? And there's something about that brings a lot of depression, it brings a lot of darkness. You can look into yourself and see your own experience. Like nothing good has ever happened from really, really broken. It's, it's darkness that comes out. But when you're with friends who, even though it's challenging at times and it's not always easy, as you choose God, as God is the foundation of your friendship and you're pursuing together all that is good, true, and beautiful, that you're going out, you're having fun, you're having a good time, you're really being honest with each other, with each other the intimacy, being able to see into one, to one another. And to see the goodness, man, to see the goodness in people. I don't think we do that a lot. We don't do that enough to look into somebody's eyes and to say, man, I see goodness in you. 
I see that you are good because that's what God does. God beholds us in goodness. And do we sin? Yeah. That's why we go to confession. That's why we have to say we're sorry to be very forgiving. But as we allow God to encounter us and he becomes the foundation of our life in a profound way, as we become good friends, we pursue what is good for others, and we receive the gift of others to themselves, our lives become whole. And we need a friendship, we need a fellowship. Christianity is not meant to be lived in isolation, it's meant to be lived in friendship. And friendship brings us, ultimately, its foundation, it brings us to the very heart of God, God who is limitless in his love for us.